Stifled by the pandemic and struck by July's riots, South Africa's economy hits one of the world's highest jobless rates. Among the worst affected, black women struggle to find work. Celebrating unity among Nigeria's diverse cultures, languages and traditions, the Nigeria 60-year photo exhibition in Abuja reflects on six decades of togetherness in one united country. Hello there, thanks for tuning in to the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Joker Rogers at Channel Television here in Lagos, and I'm joined by Vincent McCory from The Voice of America in Washington. Well, thanks, I'm Vincent McCory at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Our broadcast still looks a little different because of the global pandemic, but we truly appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Channel's television in Lagos brings you that story. Despite its diverse cultures, traditions, practices, languages and challenges, Nigeria has remained united since its 60 years of independence. The federal government says despite the challenges facing the country, the nation's unity remains unshaken. The Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, made this known at the opening of the Nigeria 60 Years Photo Exhibition in Abuja, explaining that the theme of the exhibition was carefully couched to reflect on the togetherness of the country in the past 60 years. The history of Nigeria is presented in pictorial form as the federal government rounds up the year-long activities to mark Nigeria's 60 years of nationhood ahead of the country's 61st anniversary. The photo exhibition is themed togetherness as the government hopes to highlight the diverse heritage of Nigeria, a point that the government believes young Nigerians should note in the face of several challenges facing the country. Like other countries in the world, it is an incompatible fact that Nigeria over the years has gone through challenging times. But we must not miss the fact that, it, that its resolve to remain as one individual entity has remained unshaken. The exhibition tells Nigeria's story of six decades of independence showing footprints of its founding fathers and several political leaders to the younger generation. This unity in our diversity has been aptly captured in the theme of the Diamond Jubilee celebration, Together, which emphasizes the promotion of social cohesion, national values through the impartation and adoption of civic and communal values that promote good character, patriotism, empathy, hard work, and self-reflection. Throughout history, diamonds have been known for their strength and beauty. They are considered the stone of champions and choice stones to symbolize a loving relationship. These above qualities are no doubt depictive of our journey as a nation and how God has helped us through all the pressures and challenges in the last 60 years, to weather the storms of adversity and to evolve as a strong and united nation. Joining us now for more is Professor David Awarawo, Head of Department, History and Strategic Studies, University of Lagos. Thank you so much for joining us today on Africa 54. Thank you. So it seems Nigeria's history is, you know, seems to be lost on young people in the country now. Many aren't familiar with the old days of uh, the country, what has happened in the past what the elders used to teach us. How can we revive this? Well, um, there are two ways in which uh, this can be done. Um, the government, through the agencies responsible for promoting such, and then, of course, the people themselves responding. 
when I say the government, specifically the Ministry of Education, which you know, has, uh, you know, uh, controls what is taught in schools, and then secondly, um, the National Orientation Agency, that has the responsibility to, you know, uh, educate people as to values, culture, morals, and things like that. I say this because uh, there are four major sources, you know, of imparting historical knowledge at homes, at school, uh, the wider society, and of course, uh, through the mass media. Uh, so the government has control over much of this, and of course, for the people to respond. Uh, if all of this is done, then historical knowledge, you know, will be impacted. And the good old days when, you know, history was taught, everybody knew what happened in the past, you know, will be revived. And so, you know, th there was a time when history was removed from the school uh, curriculum ac across, you know, most of the classes and uh, institutions. Uh, that must have dealt a major blow to what we are talking about now. Uh, so what, what should be done to, you know, ensure that, you know, the culture and traditions of, you know, the majority of peoples across the country is no longer eroded? Well, uh, to begin with, that was a very big mistake, and I'm sure um, everybody recognizes that now. Uh, the government itself, you know, recognized this, and uh, there are now, there is not a directive that uh, history be returned to the curriculum. Like I said before, um, teaching history in school is one of the major sources of imparting historical knowledge. And the removal from the curriculum meant that people didn't have the opportunity to, you know, learn history uh, in school. And now that, uh, you know, history has been restored into the curriculum, uh, we hope that uh, uh, we'll, we'll return to how, how things used to be, uh, that uh, history will be taught and people will be enthused about learning about the past. Because really, um, anybody who does not have knowledge of the past will simply be grouping, will be, will be working like someone who is blind. We need to know what happened in the past so we can uh, you know, correct the mistakes of the present and, of course, uh, prepare for a better future. Right, so how, how can this you know, information be passed on? I know that you know, most times we, we teach it in the classrooms, but is, is that enough? Uh, what about artifacts, paintings, drawings, folk songs, performances, you know, stage acts, movies, or any other things, visits to museums? I don't know how many we have in the country that you know, can help pass along these messages and you know, how often or how safe it is for people to travel to the destinations where you know, those artifacts you know, are put so that they can have real one-on-one you know, -on -one knowledge of these things. Yeah, um, even in school, um, there is a provision for the teaching, uh, imparting knowledge in that, in that area. There is also a provision for going on excursions. We take our students on excursions to Badagri, to several places for them to see, you know, some of those things. Uh, in contemporary times, science and technology has also helped. Um, some of these things, we, we, they, are, they are on tapes, and so we're able to play them to students and they're able to see these things. But again, the government has a lot to do. Uh, many of the museums are, you know, uh, in a very bad shape. Mm. Uh, they need to be kept in the shape in which we'll be interested in going to see them. And the artifacts themselves will need to be kept in the condition in which, you know, they will not uh, dilapidate. So which, which brings to mind, you know, the Benin bronzes. We all know, you know, what happened recently, the clamor, you know, to bring them back to uh, Nigeria from Germany and from, you know, wherever they are in the world. And of course, this back and forth as to who should have its custody, the federal government or the Bini Kingdom itself. What are your thoughts on this? Well, um, the, the, the important thing is that the, 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 art, the, the artworks, the bronzes you brought to Nigeria. This argument over who takes custody, to me, is not really too important. But I think, given the historical context of their being taken away, the right place for these things to go to is Benin. You know, these were Benin bronzes that were taken away after the invasion of Benin in February 1897. And now that these, you know, uh, uh, bronzes have to be brought back, the, the logical thing, you know, the fair thing is that these things were taken to Benin. But the issue I raised earlier, you know, still, it boggles my, it still, still disturbs me. When these artifacts come, resources you made available to keep them in the pristine condition in which they will come such that five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years down the line, 
we will not be regretting that we brought them. Because these things need specialized attention for them to be kept in the condition in which they will last for thousands of years from now. So beyond the argument over where they will be kept, and I think Benin is the right place that the, the, the page should be taken to, funds should be made available and the expertise required to keep these at, you know, bronzes in the condition in which you know, they will be able to last for as long as thousands of years from now. Do you now. think they will attract tourists? Sure, they, they, they will. They, the fact that they were taken away and brought back alone has created the condition. I would like to go and see them, for instance, you know, and I'm sure many people across Nigeria, across West Africa, across Africa, will be interested in going to see, you know, these this, this bronzes. But like I said before, attention must be paid to keeping these things in a condition in which they will last for, you know, hundreds, thousands of years from now. We must thank you for joining us today, Head of Department, History and Strategic Studies, University of Lagos, Professor David Awurawa. Thanks so very much. South Sudan's Vice President Rebecca Nyendeng Dimabior visited Washington, D.C. before heading to New York to attend the 76th United Nations General Assembly. Mrs. Dimabior sat down with viewers Nabil Biagio and talked about her country's challenge in creating a unified and well-trained military. One of, one of the things that UN is not happy is uh, we have not graduated the uh, unified forces. And now, if we are, we are going to graduate unif uh, unified forces, uh, about 53,000, we are going to graduate them with sticks. And then you just send them to the community. They will not go to the barracks. What controls the soldier is his gun or her gun. So if, if the arm embargo is there, how do you expect us to arm those people they are telling us to graduate? President Salfa said that in his speech when he was opening the parliament. Then we are graduating 53,000 unified forces. And then now we, we say that let us go ahead doing that, but we will ask for arm embargo or any other way that UN wanted us to arm this group so that they can start protecting the civilian. For example, uh, I was one of the opposition. Uh, there were a lot of difficulties before, like for example, the unknown gunmen and all these things. They are not there anymore. If you go to Juba now, uh, the economics indications are showing. On the topic of women in South Sudan, Vice President Rebecca Kanyandeng Dimabior spoke about gender equity in government and the importance of peace for women to raise their families after many lives have been lost. In my office, together with, uh, with other offices like the Ministry of Gender, uh, Child and Social Welfare, and the Parliament was just... Uh, you know, it was inaugurated, but uh, together we are working to see into it that the representation of women are uh, realized. There are some problems, yes, uh, like for example in the executive, the percentage is 26 percent, and it was supposed to be 35 percent, uh, and, and also in the parliament, but in the parliament it's much better than in the executive. If you come to the presidency, at least this percentage in the presidency it's okay because it is a place that we were not reaching. And we are not quiet. We, we are talking so that uh, what, what was not met in the other areas should be met in the other areas. So uh, I know that there, there are this problem, but the most important for us now is for our children to be secure because the women are the one carrying the brunt of everything. They are, they are losing their husband, they are losing their children. So the most important now in their agenda is to see peace coming to the country. Once peace comes, anything, you can say anything in your own country or under the, the tree, wherever you are. But now we cannot, we are not secure until the security comes. Rwandan conservationist and vet doctor Olivier Nsengimana is on a quest to save his country's grey-crowned cranes. The population of these majestic birds have been on the decline in Rwanda over the last decade due to the loss of their natural habitat and poaching. A tall and elegant grey crown crane struts despite its leg injury through the Umusambi village, a crane sanctuary in Rwanda's capital Kigali. The bird is amongst hundreds of grey crown cranes that were rescued from captivity or the illegal pet trade. Thanks to the work of Rwandan conservationist and veterinarian Dr. Olivier Insengimana, with its yellow crown of feather tipped with black and red throat pouch, 
The gray crown crane is considered one of Africa's most striking bird species and also one of its most endangered. In Rwanda, the gray crown crane has often been seen as a status and wealth symbol found in private homes or hotels where they're often kept as pets. So six years ago, there were more cranes um, in captivity, in people's houses, in hotels, than they were in the wild. And what was happening is like, um, many people really love cranes, but some people, they wanted to have them in their gardens. So there was a huge demand for illegal pet trade. So um, local communities driven by lack of awareness, poverty, they were hunting or capturing them and selling them to the dealers. And Sengimana's passion for cranes goes back to his childhood, growing up in a village filled with grey crown cranes that served as alarm clocks and provided entertainment. We didn't have watches, we didn't have like a telephone to tell the time. So we'd say, let's wake up when cranes call for the first time, let's wake up when cranes call for the second time. So it was like a time telling. So just the and the people really enjoy their dance, their call. It's just one species that means a lot in the society, in the culture. In a little over six years, Nsengimana's organization has saved over 200 cranes from captivity through various initiatives at the sanctuary with the support of the Rwandan government. Along with other community awareness initiatives, Nsengimana goes around schools sharing information with students about the need to protect cranes and other wildlife. It's time for a short break. As we do, we remind you to visit our website, channelstv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channels web. Still to come on the program, challenging the global fashion industry, an Egyptian fashion designer launches a line of clothing unique to each client's shape, size and style preference. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. South Africa's jobless rate has hit 34%, among the highest in the world, as the country's economy is stifled by the pandemic and July's riots. Black women are among the worst affected, with 41% unemployed. Linda Givertesh reports from Johannesburg. Rebecca Moale has been searching for a job to no avail since January. The recent graduate from a supply chain management program was already working in the sector when the pandemic struck and she found herself laid off. I apply almost every day, but the responses I'm getting, I'm sure I've applied more than 30 times since, but I've only gotten like two responses back. There's not much out here. I'm actually even, I even actually started applying outside the country. About 585,000 South Africans lost their job last quarter, a period marked by strict COVID-19 lockdowns. While the pandemic is taking an economic toll, economists say it's compounded with a historically bleak situation. I don't think we've turned the corner. I think uh, unemployment is likely to continue creeping up. And unfortunately, it's women that will bear the brunt of all this. Two decades of experience as a flight attendant for South Africa's national carrier didn't spare Charity Mokimane from job cuts last year. She never dreamt of retraining, but she didn't want to leave her husband as the family's sole breadwinner. You know when you keep hearing places are shedding jobs, shedding jobs, shedding jobs, then you think, oh, you know, I can't. I just decided to maybe try and look at other avenues of making money. She adopted her mother's passion for baking and started selling cakes from her home. Economists say this type of informal entrepreneurship isn't captured in employment data. It means people like Mokimana are still getting by. But for young job seekers like Moale, the disruption has curtailed dreams of building a career. The stress has also taken a toll on her mental health. I did not envision myself depressed and sitting at home. I just, it was not in my plans. I did not even imagine. South Africa's economy did grow in the first quarter of this year, but economists warn unemployment will remain high for the foreseeable future. Faced with uncertainty, Moale says all she can often do is pray. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Johannesburg. An Egyptian woman and fashion designer has decided to start her own line of clothing that's tailoring each piece of her work to the client's shape, size and style preference. This is part of efforts to counter global fashion industry trends that she says attempts to homogenize body sizes and styles. 
Dub Rafea, Arabic for the woman who mends clothing. The company was launched in 2015 by 29-year-old Noura Galal, whose main goal was to make the Egyptian woman feel beautiful, comfortable, and in control of her own body. Our goal is that Rafaya helps the Egyptian woman feel beautiful without feeling that she needs to change herself and without having to conform to a stereotypical image that the fashion industry usually sets as a goal for women. We want women to feel beautiful without facing any obstacles. Rafaya not only tailors clothes to each woman's body, but also lets the client choose the colors, cuts and fabrics, giving her complete control over how she wishes to represent herself in a piece of fashion. We try to work on different campaigns with different ideas. For example, we are trying to fight the idea that the chubby girl should wear black and not white so that she looks thinner, or that the dark-skinned girl shouldn't wear colors, for whatever reason. We try to work on these ideas, but without making ourselves subjectable to social media bullying. We try to work on this until there is enough awareness that this is normal. The thing I like most about Rafaya is that I customize what I want to fit my sizes. I don't find anything transparent, and the quality cut is always perfect. I used to struggle a lot when I went to shops, as I would find clothes with poor material, or material that is transparent. And as a veiled woman, I really struggled with those things. Things wouldn't suit me easily, or they wouldn't be my size. With Rafia, I could give them my sizes, and they would customize it exactly right. Rafia hopes to change public attitudes about women's bodies, normalizing the right to dress without conforming to global fashion standards. Whether it's the NFT, the hot new authentication technology associated with a virtual object, or online applications in which you are represented by an avatar, the virtual world is becoming increasingly perversive in our lives. In these parallel realities, we can buy properties for thousands of dollars, go for a walk with friends, or simply attend concerts. Viewers Azuma Kompaori wanted to know more about the new technology. He invites us to take a little trip into the future, into the metaverse. Hello and welcome. We're inviting you today into a very exciting journey into the future. This is Avatar Dimension. It is the only certified Microsoft Mixed Reality Capture Studio in the East Coast and just one of five around the world. The studio plays a key role in the metaverse world by creating photorealistic human holograms that are then placed into immersive environment. But wait, you said metaverse? I know someone who can tell us more about it. Her name is Kathy Hako. She's a futurist and VP at the studio. She's also a top technology voice on LinkedIn with a new book titled Augmented Workforce. So Kathy, what's the metaverse? So the metaverse, you have to really think about it as the successor of the mobile internet that we have today. So it's kind of where we're heading into the future. Easiest way to describe it is Web 1.0 connected information and you got the internet. Web 2.0 connected people and you got social media and that's kind of where we're at right now. And Web 3.0, kind of where we're starting to go, connects people, places, and things. And sometimes these people, places, and things can be in our real world, our physical world, or they can be in a virtual world. So we're talking about limiting screen time to kids today. In the next future, they're pretty much going to be living inside those same screens. How do you see this? So, I mean, it's really interesting because during the pandemic, I think the limit of screen time went out the door for parents. Um, but I do think it is a relevant point and it is a relevant concern, right? I do think that we're limiting ourselves in understanding what the metaverse is if we try to put a screen in front of it, right? Or think that the screen time that they spend looking at this flat surface is going to translate the same to how they're going to interact with the metaverse. And I think that that is a big difference. So I think that many of us that are older millennials and up uh, come from a world where virtual or digital wasn't something that we did first, right? My children who are all under 11, they are digital natives. They are used to technology, you know? And I think that every parent out there sees their children and understands that to them, their digital lives and their physical lives are equally important. 
So I think that it's a change in mindset. So Kathy, you work at Avatar Dimension, located in Ashburn, Virginia, where I'm actually in the studio, one of their studio. It works with clients to create um, volumeric videos to tell their stories. Let's have a quick tour. So this is our volumetric video studio. Um, we are only the second Microsoft uh, mixed reality capture studio in the United States, the only one on the eastern, United, uh, the eastern coast of the United States. So our stage here is comprised of 70 cameras. Uh, they're arranged in a circle 20 feet across. We have eight vertical towers of cameras and a ninth overhead rig of cameras, all pointed inwards towards the person standing in the center. There is an eight foot circle taped out here on the floor, which represents the, usual, the usable capture space um, that we can uh, record while filming. Here we go, one, two. And got it. Yes. Our studio captures raw data at a rate of roughly 1.3 terabytes per minute. One minute of processing, real time processing, takes roughly about a day. So. Once we've captured a single frame and processed it just to show that everything is recreating the way that we expect it to, we can proceed with the shoot, we can roll all of our takes, and when we're done, we'll process just the takes that we've identified as the best ones. Uh, additionally, we could take this frame, this one uh, still frame of view, add a skeleton to it, we could do what's called rigging, where we actually have the ability to repose, move your arms and your legs, we could then insert you into any three-dimensional environment and give you the freedom to walk around within it. There is a, a trajectory of education to kind of teach people, but um, we are seeing a demand where people are really interested in it, and I think it's going to accelerate faster as, uh, as more people learn about it. And that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington, Channels Television as our last word from Lagos. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Do remember that ChannelCV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Jocker Rogers. Thanks for watching and goodbye.